One of my favorite outdoor spaces in New York City is Bryant Park, and I don't think I'm alone. The park draws more than 12 million visitors annually, slightly less, of course, this year, but I would bet that most visitors never notice all the hidden secrets oh. of this wonderful scenic landmark. So for our time together this afternoon, I would like to share with you my top 10 hidden secrets of Mr. Bryant's park. Secret number one, what Bryant the, Park is uh, considered to be worthless real estate. In 1822, the city acquired the block between 5th and 6th Avenues from 40th to 42nd Streets, and the following year began using it as a potter's field, since the city believed that there was no other practical use for the property. Glenn, can I just remind everybody to mute themselves as I'm muting myself again? So we, we've heard a few people. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Peg. This is a detail from an 1828 map showing a public cemetery labeled and highlighted in green. A public cemetery or a potter's field was nothing particularly unusual. In the early 19th century, the city was already using public grounds like Washington Square, Madison Square as, pot as potter's fields. Here at Bryant Park, thousands of poor souls were buried here over the next 17 years until 1840 when they were all removed out to Wards Island. Secret number two, the park once had a very famous next door neighbor and this is probably not a really big secret for most native New Yorkers. The Croton Distributing Reservoir seen here was constructed between 1838 and 1842 on a high point along Fifth Avenue between 40th and 42nd Streets. It covered four acres or almost 175,000 square feet and its massive 50 foot high stone walls held 12, 20 million gallons of drinking water for city residents. But not only did it provide safe, clean drinking water, the reservoir was also a tourist attraction. Atop its walls, the reservoir featured a public promenade, and much like today's High Line, the promenade offered unparalleled views of the city. In 1844, one visitor by the name of Edgar Allan Poe offered this bit of sage advice to travelers to New York. When you visit Gotham, you should ride out Fifth Avenue as far as the distributing reservoir near 43rd Street, I believe. The prospect from the walk around the reservoir is particularly beautiful. You can see from this elevation the North Reservoir at Yorkville, the whole city to the Battery, and a large portion of the harbor, and long reaches of the Hudson and East Rivers. After dark, visitors were in for a special treat. One guidebook noted that you could experience a delightful scene at night with the moonlight dancing on the water. Secret number three. The first park here was created in 1846, but it did not have an official name. Once the reservoir was operational, the New York City Common Council ordered that the grounds adjoining the reservoir to the west be graded, sloped, and sodded on the sides bordering the avenues and the streets, and that the same be enclosed by a neat ornamental wooden fence, the same to be used as a public park until required for the reservoir or for other purposes. But that park was never realized. By 1853, the site was described as consisting of vacant lots strewn with rocks, deep pits, and relics of shanties. Secret number four. The park was once home to world-famous works of architecture. Capitalizing on the immense popularity of the Crystal Palace or the great exhibition of the works of industry of all nations held in 1851 at Hyde Park in London, New York built its own Crystal Palace in 1853 at Reservoir Square. The map detail I'm showing you from 1854 illustrates the enormous scale of the structure, we can see that in purple, compared to the reservoir that 
blank white box immediately to the right. Under the leadership of New York City Mayor Jacob Aaron Westervelt, the exhibition of the industry of all nations featured 4,000 exhibitors displaying American industrial wares, consumer goods, and art. In the days before photography, illustrations like this one of the Crystal Palace were used not only for marketing purposes, but also as inspiration for commemorative souvenirs, one of which is seen here in the collection of the New York Historical Society. In addition to the immense glass and iron Crystal Palace on Reservoir Square, the Ladding Observatory, named for its owner, Waring Ladding, was located directly north across 42nd Street. The iron braced wooden tower topped out at a staggering 315 feet, making it briefly the tallest structure in the United States. For the admission price of 25 cents, up to 1,500 intrepid visitors at a time could venture inside and climb a winding stairway 300 feet to the top, an exercise that was described as fatiguing, but it improves digestion, or so was the advertised claim. From this dizzying height, which was higher than the spire at Trinity Church on Wall Street, visitors could take in a bird's eye view of the city, as seen here in this painting from 1855 with the Crystal Palace and the reservoir at their feet, and the city stretched out along the island of Manhattan and Staten Island in the distance to the south, it was certainly a fantastic view, well worth the cost of admission. But sadly, the Ladding Observatory burned down on the night of Saturday, August 30th, 1856, four years after the exhibition closed. The New York Times reported that there was $130,000 worth of damage. The Crystal Palace, which was closed at the same time after welcoming more than 1 million visitors to the exhibition, suffered a similar fate two years later on Tuesday, October 5th, 1858. And what had been a very popular tourist destination, though hardly a financial success, was gone forever. Secret number five. There used to be a church directly across 42nd Street. Well, actually there used to be three churches on Reservoir Square, but this one is particularly noteworthy. The West Presbyterian Church seen in this photograph was designed by Jacob Ray Mould in 1863 for the congregation who had vacated their smaller out of date building on Carmine Street two years earlier. The congregation was led by the Reverend Thomas Samuel Hastings, father of Thomas Hastings, the architect and partner in the architectural firm of Career and Hastings. Parishioners here included Jay Gould, Alfred H. Smith, and Henry M. Flagler. With a combined wealth of its members estimated at one point to be in excess of $750 million, it was known as the Millionaire's Gate to Heaven but by 1910, 42nd Street was changing and not necessarily for the better, according to the church's leadership. Private houses were abandoned all around us. 42nd Street became a storage ground for a subway construction company and all external conditions were becoming increasingly unfavorable. In April, 1911, the West Presbyterian Church sold for the pricely sump of $1.1 million to the Aeolian Company, which constructed their new 16-story headquarters building on the site. Today, that building is the home of the SUNY State College of Optometry. Secret number six, William Cullen Bryan. What had been informally known as Reservoir Square was legally named Bryant Park on Monday, May 12, 1884, almost six years after Bryant's accidental death. For most modern day New Yorkers, William Cullen Bryant is relatively unknown, but in his time, he was quite a character. He was an abolitionist, a poet, a gifted orator, and the editor of the New York Evening Post. He also cultivated a keen interest in geology. 
Brian Chu had a wide circle of influential friends, one of whom was the artist Thomas Cole, the founder of the Hudson River School art movement. The two are depicted here in an 1849 painting entitled Kindred Spirits by Asher Durand. Brian on the left with Cole are standing on a ledge in an idealized setting overlooking a gorge in the Catskills. The painting was a gift to Brian as a remembrance of Thomas Cole who had died the year before. Brian, the talented public speaker, delivered the eulogy at Cole's funeral. In 1904, Brian's daughter donated the painting to the New York Public Library, where it was treasured for many years. Today, it is in the permanent collection of the Crystal Bridges Museum of, the, of American Art in Bentonville, Arkansas. The name Bryant Park, however, really didn't mean much to New Yorkers at first. In fact, Moses King pointed out in his 1892 edition of King's Handbook of New York, Bryant Park preserves the memory of William Cullen Bryan merely in the name. Its only statue being a bust of Washington Irving seen here in this historic photograph. Mr. Irving's brush, however, was subsequently relocated to the public school that bears his name near Union Square. But the lack of a Bryant monument was finally remedied in 1911 when the neoclassical William Cullen Bryan Memorial by Carrera and Hastings and the sculptor Herbert Adams was unveiled on the eastern end of the park. Today, as you can see, Mr. Bryan is properly maintaining his social distancing and is wearing his mask. Secret number seven. Part of the Croton Distributing Reservoir is still there. When the reservoir was demolished in the 1890s, it was replaced by the New York Public Library, also by Career and Hastings. And as a footnote, perhaps you're beginning to see a pattern here. But here is an architectural case of why reinvent the wheel when you don't have to. The architects engineered the library's foundation walls by reusing the reservoir's massive masonry foundations already in place. Not only did it save on labor, both on the demolition of the old and construction of the new, it also saved on the cost of materials. And it's 19th century engineering that still works today. Now, if you know where to look, and herein lies the secret, you can still see these immense stone walls today inside and underneath the library. I'll leave that treasure hunt as your homework assignment for the day. Secret number eight, Mr. Bryant wouldn't recognize the place today. In 1934, at the height of the Great Depression, the city undertook an ambitious redevelopment of Bryant Park. The plan was designed by Lusby Simpson, an architect from Queens who once worked for the firm of George B. Post and Son. Simpson's plan was built by workers from the Civil Works Administration and was a straightforward and symmetrical design. Elements included terraces raised above street level, lined with limestone balustrades, a depressed central lawn, and four flagstone walkways sheltered by rows of trees and separated by beds of ivy and bordered by handsome benches. It was designed to encourage repose and leisurely strolling. And in the year, immediate years that followed, it became a necessary and useful part of the urban fabric and much used and enjoyed by the people of New York City, so one social commentator said. Secret number nine, Bryan Park has the first major monument to honor an historic woman. Once called the Grand Dame of Social Reformers, Josephine Shaw Lowell, among her many accomplishments, was the first female member of the New York State Board of Charities. The pink Stony Creek granite fountain was designed by Charles Adams Platt, a prominent artist, landscape designer, and architect of his day. But here's the secret. Next to the fountain inscribed in a granite marker is this dedication. This foundation commemorates the strong and beautiful character of Josephine Shaw Lowell, 
1843 to 1905, wife for one year of a Patriot soldier, widow at 21, servant of New York State and city in their public charities, sincere, candid, courageous, and tender, bringing help and hope to the fainting and inspiring others to consecrated labors. The fountain was originally dedicated on Tuesday, May 21st, 1912, but at that point, the fountain was located on the eastern end of Bryant Park. The fountain was moved as part of the 1934 renovations to its present location on the western end of the park near 6th Avenue. And finally, drum roll please, secret number 10. Bryan Park has the best public bathrooms in the city. Okay, maybe that's not a secret either for most New Yorkers, but this comfort station has been here for more than a century. In this wonderful photograph from April 1920 of the 42nd Street side of the park looking west, you see, there it is, the city's best public bathroom. But perhaps you may not know that it has a twin. And here it is on the 40th Street side across from the Bryant Park Hotel. And this landmark is a subject for a future tour. Both of these handsome granite kiosks are the work of Carrera and Hastings. Designed as comfort stations, they were to complement the classical architecture of the library and serve a useful purpose at the same time. And as such, they are wonderfully embellished by garlands Ukrainia, and other architectural elements from ancient Rome. Today, this one is used as a comfort station and recently renovated, it is certainly worth the trip inside. The other, however, is a rather elegant storage shed. So, there you have it. My top 10 hidden secrets of Mr. Bryant's park. I hope you enjoyed this fast paced and brief virtual tour this afternoon. And I hope it has inspired you to venture out for a socially distant, leisurely stroll in the park. Thank you. We'll open up for questions at this time. Okay. Um, our first question is from Veronica and she asks if the fires were considered arson. Um, not to my knowledge, um, though because the Ladding Observatory was a wood frame structure, um, it wouldn't have taken much to, for the thing to burn down in the first place. Um, so I have not seen any evidence of arson, but uh, something I can look into for you. Great. The next question is, where was the potter's field relative to the reservoir? Um, it was next door to the reservoir and actually predates the reservoir. So it seems that most of the potter's field occupied the areas along 6th Avenue, which is where um, Reservoir Square at today's Bryant Park is. Um, but they certainly could have used the entire um, block, both of um, from 5th to 6th Avenues and from 40 to 42nd Street. Um, unfortunately, there's no documentation that tells you where all the bodies were buried, um, but it seems plausible that it was also underneath where the reservoir is now, or was then. Great. Um, and then we just have a couple of comments. Uh, despite the live 50s TV start and a very enjoyable, entertaining um, this is a very enjoyable, entertaining, and informative presentation. Bravo. Thank you. And the public restrooms, amen to that. <laughs> <laughs> um, next question is, did the park have a renaissance in the 90s? It did have a res res renaissance in the 90s, and I'm going to leave that for a future topic tour, um, because that's quite a story um, in its own right. Um, so I will, I will defer that question to a future um, virtual tour. Great. 
Great. Next question is, do we know the architect for the Crystal Palace? I do have that. I believe I have brought it with me. And to whomever asked that question, I will have to send it to you because I don't have my notes with me on that. But it was fantastic engineering of the day. Um, cast iron, glass, um, quite an engineering marvel. Okay, the next question, um, not sure if this was covered, but when were the library shelving placed under the park? That was the 1990s um, renovations. Okay, and... And that's on my bucket list to someday get down there. <laughs> uh, just a few more comments. Terrific talk. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Um, oh, here are a few more questions. Was the Crystal Palace considered fireproof? Um, according to the fire insurance maps, yes, it was fireproof. Um, but as you can tell from what I told you, it actually burned down. Okay. The next, um, do you know when you will do a Bryant Park Hotel talk? I heard once the building was called the Big Black Mammy with the Gold Cap Tooth. Do you know if that's true? Um, I don't know if that's true or not, but uh, I'll have to see what, I'll have to see when we're going to do the Bryant Park Hotel tour. Um, how does a glass and cast iron building burn down? Um, it burns down from what's inside. So whatever st was stored inside, um, the combustible materials inside will ignite, which will compromise the cast iron structure and it will come down. Um, at the time, the, um, after the exhibition had ended, the city was trying to figure out what else they could do with the Crystal Palace. Um, and at one point it became storage for um, other business entities that were trying to make a go of it. Um, it was that stuff that actually caught on fire and burned down and caused the structure to come down. Um, oh, and Colleen did a little research. The Crystal Palace architects were George Carstensen and Charles Gildemeister. Gildemeister? Okay. Um, how, next question is, how much on city did the reservoir serve? How much of the city did the reservoir serve? Um, it much? was a great, great deal of the downtown east side area. Um, I don't know the exact number of, of um, households it served, um, but it actually covered a lot of real estate downtown. Um, I remember the park in the 70s when much of the park was a public restroom. Can you briefly describe the decline of the park? So the general decline, um, 60s, 70s, um, the area was experiencing just what was generally declining in the city at the time. Um, because if it's a great big open space, it attracted um, vagrants etc. Um, early 80s, you didn't want to go there um, as a respectable person. Um, but it was just a, a symptom of a larger problem that was happening in the city at the time. Um, that could be a whole different lecture on its own, talking about the social implications of um, that time period. Um, but it was a symptom of a much larger problem that was happening in the city at the time. I hope that answers the question. A um, couple more questions. Where did the city's water supply go after the reservoir was demolished? Underground. <laughs> um, and that system still works today. Um, so um, that's how we get our, our drinking water here in the city is all the underground. The two major tunnels that are still there um, still work. Um, the city is building the third tunnel now um, I don't know if I'll live to see it finished, um, but that's where the, the water comes from today. It's basically coming from the same spot, 
um, north of here. Um, it's just coming through a different um, pathway. Uh, just one more question. Is there a story to there being one architectural firm seeming to do a lot of the buildings? I'm sorry, can you say that again? Is there a story um, or is there one architectural firm that seems to be doing a lot of the buildings? Like, is it the same firm, I guess? If I understand that correctly. Um, I'm not sure if he was, if the question is about present day or back when we were building the library. Sounds like back then. Back then. So mm -hmm. back when we're, when we're doing the library, um, there's a handful, maybe a half a dozen of principal architectural firms handling pretty much all the major public building competitions. Um, and they're competing with each other. Um, so um, for example, at, at Grand Central um, Terminal, um, all the same architectural firms are competing for that job. And there's a handful of those. Um, same thing for the library, same thing for um, all the major public buildings at the time. So there's there's a handful of, of those architectural firms um, that are working at the time. Okay, then the rest of the comments are just saying, thank you, great talk. And yes, there will be, um, if there is a new, um, the next virtual tour, when I, whatever that is, will be communicated uh, via email. So. Well, I have kind of a question comment. I had no idea that that fountain was a memorial to a woman. Mm -hmm. Isn't it interesting that the men got the statues and she got her name engraved on the base of a fountain? Right. And did you discover that? I mean, in all the talk about getting memorials to women and monuments to women, I never heard that come up. Yeah, I haven't either. And I, I keep waiting for that to, um, to arise. Um, as a footnote of the fountain, um, there's several guidebooks online resources, um, other websites refer to it as a black granite fountain, um, which I always found curious because it doesn't look black to me anyway. So I did some research and some contemporary descriptions from the early 1900s refer to it as pink um, granite and they specify um, Stony Creek granite. Well, Stony Creek granite is pink. Um, it's where it comes from. Um, so that's that's a side note. Um, I discovered the inscription um, years ago when I first moved to New York. Um, a friend of mine said, you have to go, if you haven't been to Bryant Park, you should take a walk around Bryant Park because I think you would enjoy it, you know, to see it. So I was drawn to the fountain and looked down and there's the inscription. And I knew nothing about um, what it was or who she was or what she did or why it's there. Um, so it's one of those hidden in plain sight secrets um, mm -hmm. that the, um, the powers that be need to be made aware of. And um, she did most of her work on the Lower East Side, but they decided not to put the fountain on the Lower East Side. They wanted it in a prominent central location. So they picked Bryant Park as the location for the fountain. Any other questions, comments? All right, well, let's thank Glenn for another terrific talk, and we look forward to seeing you um, at our next Explore New York uh, walking tour. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you very much. Thank you.